So I'm Jenna Weens. I'm an associate professor in computer science and engineering. I'm part of the AI lab, and I have the pleasure of chairing our spotlight session in which we'll hear from five rising stars in AI. Each will give a quick three minute talk. Um, so they're going to be whirlwind back to back. Um, but after this session, you'll be able to meet the speakers in our virtual gather.town space um, for Q&A. So kicking us off, we have Ireti Aya Aknola. So Ireti, if you can um, share your screen and your video. Um, Ireti recently obtained his PhD degree in computer science from Columbia University, working with Professor Peter Allen. Take it away, Ireti. Thanks for having me. And I'm Ireti. And today I'll be presenting a line of research that I did during my PhD at Columbia University. Yeah, robotic researchers are generally interested in getting robots to perform tasks autonomously, but it is still important to have humans in the loop to specify the tasks to be performed, provide some form of demonstration, or evaluate feedback to the robot as it performs the task. There are a number of ways to provide such inputs to the robot. For example, you can have mouse clicks or joysticks to give inputs to the robot. A human can manually move the robot's body parts to provide an example of how to perform the task. You can send voice commands to the robot, or you can use brain computer interface to measure physiological signals from the humans, which is then passed to the robot. While the first three categories are generally used, the fourth category is largely developed for assistive robotics application for humans with impairment. And my research in this space is inspired by a finding in neuroscience that says that whenever it's, um, an, a, a human sees a task going wrong, there's an error signal that is fired in the brain, which is measurable using the brain computer terms. My research has been focused on using this error signal as evaluative feedback to teach robots how to perform different tasks. For example, here is a navigation task where the goal is to get the robots to move to a target location indicated by the blue pillar. The reinforcement learning algorithm that uses sparse reward is unable to learn this task because of poor exploration. But having a human provide them um, evaluative feedback to the robots, we can get the robots to do the task. So how does it work? Here you have a human with an EEG headset that measures electrical activities of the human as he observes the robot learn to perform the task. The brain signals are recorded and passed through a neural network classifier that maps the brain signals into some error-related potential. This is sent as evaluative feedback to the robot so that it can update its policy and learn to perform actions that will not elicit error signals from the human brain, so it learns to perform the task. Finally, to be able to extend our algorithm from 2D environments to higher dimensional spaces, we introduce two key components. First, um, we use active learning such that the robot is able to speed through actions that it is certain about and slow down when it is uncertain which action to take so the human can provide a feedback. Then we use purified buffer such that it keeps track of the statistics of the feedback it has received so far and it learns to learn from feedback that are consistent over time. For more information about the algorithm and some future work, I'll be very delighted to chat with you at the poster session. Thank you. Thank you, Irete. Really cool work. Um, next up, we have Chianti Brantley, a final year PhD student at the University of Maryland College Park, um, who's advised by Hal Domey. So if you could go ahead and share your screen, perfect. Awesome. Can you see? Yes. Yeah, that was pretty cool work. I was like, oh, I need to check his work out. I hadn't seen it. Uh, so everyone, uh, my name is Keontae Brantley. Uh, I'm a final year PhD student at the University of Maryland College Park. Today, I'm going to talk to you about broadly my research agenda and problems I like to work on. Uh, the title of my talk is called Solving Sequential Decision-Making Problems with Experts. So in sequential decision-making, uh, such as trying to train a robot to go around a race car track, or sequence labeling in uh, the name entity recognition task where you're given a source sentence, and the goal, is predict the, uh, the goal is to predict the entities of each of the words in the sentence. Or text generation for like a, a word descrambling task where you're given a sentence and you, and you scramble the words and the goal is to unscramble the words in the sentence. Or in video games where you try to train an agent to like solve, uh, to play, to solve games such as Ms. Pac-Man. And all these sequential decision-making problems, 
the de facto standard for solving these is called reinforcement learning. But the issue uh, in reinforcement learning is that it requires millions of interactions in the environment to solve these sequential decision-making problems. So in reinforcement learning, typically we're given an agent in an environment and the agent interacts with the environment by taking actions, which you can think of as turning the steering wheel in the car. And the environment returns a state, which you can think about what the agent sees. And the environment also returns a reward, which is plus one for crossing the fish line and zero for this environment, for the setting. Now, if I try to train an agent using reinforcement learning to solve this particular task, the agent will get stuck. Um, and why does it get stuck? The problem is that the, the sequence of actions needed to receive reward is long. Like the agent has to go around the entire track in order to learn to get a positive signal. So a lot of my research uh, uh, is done in this area called imitation learning to sort of try to deal with this sparse reward issue. So in imitation learning, typically we're given an expert or Oracle demonstrator uh, states and actions. So given this training set to consist of the state and actions from the expert, the goal is to learn the agent to match from the expert states to the expert actions. So broadly, my research agenda is uh, how can we leverage experts beyond typical demonstration data? So in imitation learning, uh, uh, the first algorithm that's sort of introduced in the setting is called behavioral cloning, but it's known in theory that it's solved from something called the, it, su it suffers from something called the confounding error problem. And there's been a new algorithm to introduce to solve this issue called Dagger that solves it using interactions. So basically basically, what Dagger does is it allows you to query an expert to ask for expert, hey, what should I do now that I'm stuck? Or hey, expert, what action should I take in this setting? So these are two algorithms that are not mine. These were introduced uh, in the setting before I started doing research. So uh, in NIRPS uh, 2019, I introduced an algorithm called Apropos, which basically says, Experts can provide constraints. So instead of providing demonstration data, an expert can give you a set of constraints to satisfy, which is more sample efficient because the expert doesn't have to play a video game for a long time or drive a car around a track for a long time. The expert can simply say, here are a set of constraints that you should abide by and solve the problem such that the constraints are satisfied. In ACL 2020, I have introduced an algorithm called Leachy, which says an expert can provide a cheap heuristic to reduce expert uh, data needed to solve the problem. And I have sort of a host of other algorithms in a bunch of other different settings um, around this issue of like, how do we leverage experts to make uh, the problem more solvable in a more sample efficient manner? Uh, if you, thank you for listening. If you have any other questions or want to sort of chat with me about my research and problems I've worked on and come to my poster session. Awesome. Thank you, Keanji. I'll definitely be at your poster with lots of questions. Um, next up, we have Karis Moses. So Karis, go ahead and share your screen and your video. Um, Karis is a PhD student at MIT, um, working in CSAIL with professors Tomas Lozano Perez and Leslie Kibling. Um, go ahead. Hello, give me one second. Um, I was hoping to use, okay, can you see the right view? Yeah. Awesome. All right, hi everyone, my name is Karis, um, and today I'll be talking about my latest work. And so, this work is motivated by the fact that um, designing models for planning for robots can be very challenging um, as these models can be pretty complex. They, um, so to plan more efficiently, people usually specify some sort of simplified model, which maybe ignores the effects of noise, such as if this robot is trying to place this block, it might have some noise in actuation um, or poorly modeled object properties. So in this example, if it's trying to place the green block and we're not modeling the center of mass, then we're not gonna have any chance of accurately modeling whether this tower will be stable or not after the placement takes place. And so in this work, we're trying to learn accurate action models, which capture real world phenomena such as noise are learned in a data efficient manner. So kind of like the last talk, we want to um, be more efficient because um, collecting data on a robot can be very expensive. And so we need to be um, you know, mindful of how much time we're spending on the robot to learn these models. And lastly, we want something that generalizes over different planning problems. We don't want what we learn to be useful for just one task, but multiple. And so in this work, the robot is actually given um, object properties directly 
but what it needs to learn is how these objects interact. So specifically in this work, if it builds a tower of specific objects, will it be stable or not? And so we model this feasibility model, we call it an action feasibility model with the state, which is the blocks that the robot has placed so far and the action, which is the block it's about to place. We use a graph neural network so that we can generalize to different tower sizes, which is pretty important in many um, tasks where the robot is expected to interact with a lot of objects. And finally, this model outputs a probability that this action is feasible, which in this task means, will the tower be stable or not? And so this is just a quick system overview. We have a planner, which takes in some objective function as well as the feasibility model so that we can generate plans and know um, the feasibility of those plans. Then we pass the plan to an execution module, which then executes it and labels all of the actions the robot took and whether or not they were feasible. So there are two phases. In the learning phase, the objective for the planner is some sort of information gain objective, which I'm not going to go into the details of, but it's trying to take action such that it can learn the best action feasibility model. And then at evaluation time, the objective is now a task objective. We're trying to maximize some reward. So I'm just going to quickly go over these two tasks that we evaluated. There's the longest overhang where it's trying to maximize the distance between the bottom and the top block. And then this maximum unsupported area task where we're trying to maximize the area between blocks that's not in contact with another block. And one cool thing about this work is we kind of set up an autonomous experimentation pipeline so that we or some poor undergrads wouldn't have to be resetting the world manually on our own. Um, so everything was autonomous. And I mean, it's a robotics uh, learning project. So obviously it wasn't fully autonomous, but much better than us resetting every tower. And in the end, we constructed 400 towers to learn from in 55 hours. And I'm out of time. So basically our method was better than a method which would ignore, ignore these noise models. Um, and this is just showing how many towers fell for each task. So ours is on the bottom and many fewer towers fell than an analytical stability model. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk at the poster. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karis. Awesome work in robotics. I hope you all have a chance to learn more about our Robotics Institute. Um, next up, we have Shabani Sintrakar, a postdoc at Stanford University, um, working with Satsu Hashimoto, Percy Liang, and Teng Yu Ma. Shabani received a PhD in computer science from MIT in 2021, where she was advised by Alexander Madri in Nir Shavit. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to talking to you today about some of the work that I've been doing for the last couple of years. So let's just get right into it. Uh, sorry, for some reason I've lost my mouse on Zoom, so I might have to, okay. Uh, so needless to say that in the last few years, we've made tremendous progress in machine learning. Uh, we see machine learning models succeeding at complex benchmark tasks across domains. And so now we find ourselves at the next step where some of these models are being taken from the carefully curated environments where they were developed and being deployed into the real world. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to stop sharing because I can't switch slides for some reason. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so we're being take, uh, we're taking these models from these carefully curated environments where they were developed and now deploying them in the real world where the stakes are also very real. So a big question that we need to ask ourselves going forward is, are we already there? Do we have the right set of tools and techniques that we need to deploy these models robustly and reliably in the real world? And is all we need just scaling up these models with uh, bigger data? And so to give you a bit of a sneak peek into my research, the short answer in my view actually is no. And the key reason for this is that even though our machine learning models do very well on benchmarks, the reasons why they do so are fundamentally different from what we expect. And to kind of see this, let's look at one of the standard machine learning tasks, say that of image classification. So when we as humans think about a task like image classification, we often break down the data into a set of human meaningful features and expect our models to just use these to perform the task. 
However, what we find in our work is that our standard data sets often contain a bunch of other features that are also very predictive, which can also be very unintuitive or even imperceptible to humans. And note that from the perspective of a model just maximizing accuracy, any predictive or useful feature is a great feature to use. And in fact, there is no reason a priori for a model to just prefer the human meaningful features. We find that as a consequence of this, standard models actually end up relying on these brittle and unreliable features in the data. And this is one of the leading causes for the existence of adversarial examples. However, this issue is not just limited to adversarial examples, and this turns out to happen very often, where standard models rely on other unreliable features in the data, such as background or high frequency information or textual information to make their predictions. And after all, if the models are relying on such brittle features to make their predictions, it's likely that their performance on benchmarks is not going to really be reflective of how well they'll perform in the real world. So a big question that I've been asking in my research is how do we go about fixing this? And one way we can do this is focusing not only on what models predict or how accurately they predict the labels, but on why they make these predictions. And in order to do this, my research has focused on taking a features perspective of the ML pipeline, in particular, focusing on every component of the ML pipeline and asking what features do these induce models to learn and how does this align with the real world tasks that we actually care about, in particular, focusing on what features current models depend on, why they learn these features, and how we can modify these features learned by models. And I'm gonna stop here, but I look forward to chatting with all of you at the poster session. Thank you. Thank you, Shivani. Yeah, we see this type of shortcut learning all the time in healthcare when working with medical imaging data and it's, it's really scary. So good to have solutions. Um, lastly, um, but certainly not least, we have Angela Stewart, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, she received a PhD in computer science from the University of Colorado Boulder in 2020. Welcome, Angela. Thank you uh, so much for that introduction, Jenna. I am so excited to be here talking with you all um, about some of my work in designing AI-enabled education experience experiences. Um, and this is work I've done alongside some of my uh, collaborators. So uh, jumping right in, we're looking at engagement. We're focusing on engagement because it is shown to be crucial to learning. And so what we want to know is what are the ways that learners are engaged? Can we predict this automatically um, in order to embed this into a system that responds to learners' engagement and helps them to engage in more productive behaviors. We're particularly looking at a group of 10 middle school girls participating uh, in an online computer science camp. And this is a diverse group of middle school girls, a racially diverse group of middle school girls. Uh, so uh, we first took a very kind of standard view of engagement, looking at whether or not they were speaking out loud, and we found overall there were few uh, indicators, um, uh, there were few indicators that they were engaging verbally, so they were not engaging very often. But what's the problem with focusing on this one view? The problem is that this centers dominant behavioral norms. So said another way, this centers a very white and male perspective of what it means to be engaged. Things like raising your hands, um, it's both gendered and raced uh, and racialized in terms of what it means to be engaged. Um, and so whenever you consider other views of what it means to engage that take into account learners diverse cultures and backgrounds and values, you can expand your definitions of engagement. So we layered in this idea of context, what is happening when learners are engaging, and what we found that in small group activities, learners were making more verbal contributions. And what we also found was that they were creating aiding computer programs during very unexpected moments. And then we layered in this idea of content. When we did that, we found that learners were taking the initiative to lead their peers in the discussion in these small group discussions. Um, we also found that learners were um, 
uh, that learners were reflecting deeply on the topics of the camp in their individual coding assignments, and they weren't saying these things out loud. So we had so many unmeasured rich ways in which learners were engaging whenever we focused on that binary view of engagement of whether or not they were speaking out loud. So let's zoom this out high level. What does this mean for AI systems? Uh, in order for AI systems to respond to real world people, they must move beyond binary views of um, beyond binary views of behaviors and consider both context and content. I would love to talk with you all about some of the topics I um, touched on in this lightning talk today. In particular, AI enabled education experiences or technologies that push back against dominant behavioral norms. Thank you so much for listening to me today. Thanks, Angela. Um, and thank you everyone for attending uh, this session.